Right, good morning. This is day one. Well, it's actually sort of slightly day minus one of this new project that I've launched called I Paint Your Life Live. This is going to be quite relaxed and quite um, laid back. It could be an absolute technical disaster. Um, who knows, really, to be perfectly honest. <coughs> We're going to just have to wait and see. Uh, I have got a chat box open here at the side. I don't know whether it's going to work. Everything is a bit fingers crossed this morning, to be perfectly honest. Um, I've set all the tech up in this room over the last few days and I have spent hours and hours and hours setting it up and testing it and trying to make sure that it works. And hopefully it's going to. Hopefully you can actually see me now and, and I'm not sitting there just talking to myself, which I imagine I might be, uh, first of all, to be honest. It's not going to take off straight away, I don't imagine. But on the basis that there might be somebody out there watching. Let's crack on. What I'm going to do today is I'm actually going to do, I suppose you might call it a test painting. The whole idea of um, this project, I Paint Your Life, is that you send me photographs from your life and I sit here in my studio and paint them and talk to you at the same time and you can watch. It's going to take me a few hours. This is not a quick thing. Um, it's something that in the past I've, I've sort of always wanted to do in a way. But um, the technology wasn't there for me at the time. Um, you go and online and you see a lot of people painting don't you you see people doing demonstrations and they've got all this technology set up so you can see it brilliantly and all that sort of thing uh and then you watch them paint a painting in maybe half an hour or something like that i mean we all remember bob ross don't we we all remember good old bob there with these little squirrels and all that sort of thing and his afro haircut and that rhythmically gentle, lilting voice that he had. Um, painting those paintings in what appeared to be about 20 minutes. <laughs> Fact of the matter was that for every one of those programmes, Bob Ross painted three identical paintings. And then it was all edited together. Now this isn't like that. These paintings don't take half an hour they don't take an hour they <clears throat> they generally take a few hours to complete so now technology seems to have caught up with me in some way and we're in a situation where live streaming is order of the day now I don't have a huge super fast internet connection so how this is going to go we're just going to have to wait and see um, but I've tried it, I've tested it, and I think, I think we're going to be okay. Um, so each morning, uh, probably about five days a week, I'm not going to do, try and enslave myself to the computer and try and do seven days a week. Um, but probably about five days a week. <coughs> Excuse me. Each morning, um, I'm going to start a new painting. And during the, during the day, you will be able to see the painting emerge. I will try and talk you through the painting as I'm doing it. Sometimes I might just go off and <coughs> ramble. 
that's a good start, Stephen. I just used a rubber on this paper that um, <coughs> isn't up to the job. Now then. Great start. Back in one minute. The, oh no, there it is. I couldn't find the rubber. There we go. That's better. There was just a little mark on the paper. And I uh, was trying to sort of rub it off with one of those rubbers on the back of a pencil. But they're no great, are they? Anyway, that's better. That will do nicely. Might put a bird down if it still shows. Right. So the painting that <coughs> I'm going to do today. Oh, actually, let's let's uh, before I get on to the painting that I'm going to do today, let's give you a little walk through the, the setup. Um, if I click this, I believe yes, indeed, we get a shot overhead of the desk. And what you can see here is an overall shot of, of the desk. There's uh, just had a shot here. There's a great big pot of water. It's always very important <coughs> when you're painting in watercolour, I find, to have the largest pot of water that you can comfortably put on your desk. Um, that way the water stays cleaner for longer. I mean, it's just as simple as that, really. Uh, also out of shot, whoops, a daisy, good start, is a roll of kitchen roll. And two pots of brushes. Over here, we have my trusty old watercolour box. <coughs> now, I bought this box now. My goodness me, how long ago did I buy this? I, I was trying to work it out last night. I think I must have bought this box around about 1989. I think so that would make it about 30 would that make it what 32 years old or something like that um, and it's been absolutely fantastic it's been one of the best things I ever bought when it comes to, to painting um, I had an extra row of paints here to uh, to give me what I want but it's one of those things you sort of it's like knowing your tools understanding your toolkit i know every color in this box um i very rarely add any other color to to the palette only if a, if the painting really really demands it uh, but you just get used to knowing what happens when you put your brush in here or in here or in here or in here um familiarity i suppose it has this lovely china palette and a drawer below here um and usually living underneath the palette are these strips that i made i don't know about you but i have this habit of <coughs> sort of doing things um you know, when these paints need replenishing, all I do is I buy tubes and I squeeze the tube paint into the uh, the little containers here and, and, and replenish them. But uh, even now, after all these years, I am guilty of going, now what make was that colour? Because this palette's made up of paints from... <coughs> Excuse my little cough here. Little frog in my throat. Ah, oh, there we go. A little sip of tea. These, uh, this palette is made up of paints from different manufacturers. Mainly either Windsor & Newton or De La Roni. But, if you uh, are an artist and you work in watercolours or you work in any other colour I suppose 
you'll realize that different companies have the same name for paints that are all sorts of different colors to be honest i use one of the my mainstays of my palette is, a, is Payne's gray um one company's Payne's gray can be very gray edging towards black another company's Payne's gray can be a shade of a, a deep blue and so you get used to it but you've got to remember what you've got so this is what I did ages ago as I made some little swatches there can you see hold it up there to the camera and then <clears throat> and beneath the swatches I actually wrote the name of the color and more importantly which manufacturer it is that I use and I usually keep that underneath the palette there um, and that way when it comes to replacing them I know what to order and I know I'm going to get the correct thing I'll take you through the box hold on I think I can zoom in on it there it is I know that's a really awful picture I've had real trouble getting this to um, getting this to take and then I come this morning and I realize that there's a glint of light coming through the window here that is just touching the edge of the box so you just have to bear with me as the day goes on that as the sun moves around that will disappear um, but let me walk you through it over here starting in the top left hand corner we have a slightly greeny sort of blue which is known uh, as thalo cyanide blue or thalo blue with that's thalo with a ph thalo blue um this is a day the rony color um there are different tints of it but it's a lovely blue i use it for mixing with uh different shades of brown and different shades of yellow to give good folded colors and that sort of thing you wouldn't generally want to use it in a sky not unless you're going for some kind of stormy sort of sky but the, the one that usually works brilliantly for the sky for me I, I find is the next color which is French ultramarine um, another day the only color next to that we've got hookah's green uh, hookah's green is a great mixing green you can't tell on this picture on this uh camera shot here unfortunately um what this how, how green this is but it's a very vivid green but it mixes beautifully with uh any of anything you put it with you can mix anything with hookah's green and create thousands of different shades of green uh and brown and uh, it mixes together beautifully Next to that is a colour, a nice rich orangey yellow, a nice rich yellow called New Gamboge. Next to that we've got transparent yellow. Transparent yellow works beautifully when you're working with uh, uh, foliage. It also works fantastic for things like sunsets uh, and sunrises and everything because it's a very, very transparent colour. And it picks up the white of the paper underneath and it really glows so i love transparent yellow it's one of my favorites next to that good old yellow ochre yellow ochre the mainstay of everybody's box for many many years here we have a color called rose dore you can't see very well in this in this light maybe if i put my hand ah there you go you can see it now this is actually um a pink uh, but it's a very transparent pink a very gentle pink and rose dory works beautiful when you're doing portraits it will mix together with different shades of uh, a little bit of burnt sienna and the, or a little bit of uh, one of the yellows and you can get all sorts of beautiful skin tones um, with it you won't see that too much in today's painting because 
there aren't many actual natural skin tones as you'll see as we start on it but um, other paintings that we come to later in the project you'll see me using Rose Dore an awful lot next to that good old Alizarin Crimson a nice deep red but very very transparent again almost every color in my box is a transparent color uh, as much as possible I try I try to steer away from opaque colors which is why you don't see uh, any cadmiums or anything in here I like to paint with watercolor that is very very trans transparent so that way it doesn't muddy muddy up and that way it stays nice and clear no messages yet <coughs> so I don't know whether anyone is watching um, but we'll carry on uh, fact of the matter is of course that um, this will stay on uh, online for um, a long time after I finish this so it's going to just end up becoming a long video on my uh, on my feed so you know you could be watching this in five years time ten years time so if you are hello from the future no from the past hello to the future from the past get it right um, <clears throat> one of the problems with starting doing this first thing in the morning is I'm always a bit croaky uh, anyway <clears throat> Where was I? Oh yeah, there we go. Next to that we've got Burnt Sienna. Uh, one of the most beautiful colours. and It can either be orange or it can be brown, or depending on how you use it. Next to that we've got Raw Umber and good old Burnt Umber. Burnt Umber and French Ultramarine. You could almost paint every painting with just those two colours when it comes down to it. <coughs> Next to that, Payne's Grey. You will see me use Payne's Grey a lot. I use it a lot instead of black uh, because it, it gives a nice deep dark without being too um, too sort of dense. But if you put it on really strong, it can be really solid and dense. Next, here we have, in a little separate pot all on its own, we have a colour called Warm Sepia, uh, which I don't use very often, but when I do, uh, it, it's very useful. It's a brown. This is a, You see, I've got everything arranged in, in sort of order of preference, and really, uh, except for these ones down here that I added later, and I wasn't sure how to put them in. This one next to it, we have Ivory Black, which is a sort of browny black. It's not too black and dense in that way. Next to that, we've got a, a gray, really, uh, color called neutral tint, which can be a very dark sort of buoy black again, very similar in many ways to Payne's gray, but without, with, with less of a blue tint. Good old cerulean, uh, which can be used beautifully for skies, if the sky is, it's the right sort of sky. Um, Quite often might be I'll, I'll do a sky and it'll start off in um, French ultramarine <coughs> and then as we get closer to the horizon as it warms up we'll go into cerulean blue um, next to that a lovely color a lovely blue uh, sort of almost virgin on turquoise manganese blue sap green and raw sienna and that's it um, I never use all the colours in the box in a painting. It just doesn't work out that way. You can see here the ones that have actually got the great big holes in them and that are worn right down <coughs> tend to be the colours that uh, I work with the most. So, let's have a look at the painting that we're going to paint today then. Now then, <clears throat> you're going to find, if this project works well, which 
it has done before, so I don't see any reason why it shouldn't again, you are going to find that people send me all sorts of things. You can see on the pictures behind me here, the, the, some of the paintings from the last time I did a project like this. And I've got lots of people, I've got cars, I've got horses. I've got, every painting is an individual challenge. Every painting is, it's a way of interpreting the world, I suppose, but you're interpreting somebody else's world. This is one of the unique things with I Paint Your Life. It's me getting the opportunity to, <coughs> to present to you a world that um, is in your head. And I've got to interpret that in a way that that connects to you. Um, and it took me quite a, a long time to realise how to interpret all these different scenes in different ways and still make them paintings. One of the problems that you get with... Um, I don't know whether it was the case in the past for artists. I, I doubt it, but we grow up in a we've grown up in a, an era where we see photographs, we see um, reproductions every day, over and over and over again. We see hundreds, thousands of reproductions, and every one of those reproductions is, a, in a way, it's a fake. It's a fake of real life because you'll find that I'll be painting this painting here and to me on this screen here, it will look in a certain way. On my screen, it looks as near as the real thing as possible. I've got another screen up here. This screen will give it a slightly different tint. Anybody that's watching it out there in the wide world of uh, the internet is watching it on a different piece of equipment and every one of those pieces of equipment will colour it slightly differently. Macs are notorious for colouring things in a different way to PCs. It's just the way it's all set up. So what I... <coughs> What I do here is I give an estimation. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm just going to just turn this microphone off a second. There we go. I'm not used to this um, talking so early in the morning. I will warn you as well that it is getting really hot warm in here. Uh, I've got the door shut because this side, uh, there's a door to my left here, and it tends to let a shaft of light straight through that uh, doesn't look brilliant. So I boarded the window up and uh, closed the door. But it does mean that it's uh, really rather warm in here. Anyway, let's crack on. What I was saying is, <clears throat> it's all down to interpreting the painting. And what I get sent is generally a photograph nowadays that you've taken on your phone. That's well, that's why we do it nowadays, isn't it? I do it. I haven't had a, a proper, in inverted commas, camera for years and the phone on my camera is fantastic it's one of the best um, cameras that I've ever owned but what the um, this means is that the photographs that we take 
are generally what you would call candid shots. They are, see it, click, see it, click, see it, click. And what we don't realise, and what we get used to seeing all the time on photographs, is that the lens of the camera distorts what it's seeing. Now, your eye doesn't do that. Your eye compensates and your brain compensates. You look at the horizon and the horizon is straight. You look at walls and they are straight. What a lens does is it looks at it and it distorts it. So, <clears throat> if I... And I, and I see this happening all the time, actually, when I look at paintings on the internet. Um, and it bothers me. You can, I can tell when I look at a painting straight away that it's been painted from a photograph, which is fine, I don't mind that. But it's just been painted as that camera shot has seen it. And the walls are going like this, or like this, or like this. So one of the first things I have to do when I get uh, the photograph that you send me is to check it over and correct anything that um, might be out of place that might not actually work in reality. So this uh, photograph that I'm going to work from today is actually... Uh, a photograph that my wife took a couple of weeks ago we went to the seaside and this is a photograph of our son's girlfriend who came with us sitting looking out to sea and I, I thought it was such a lovely image that uh, we'd use that today basically to try out this system and see if it works let me have a little um, fiddle here with the computer and let me see there we are there's the photograph that we're going to be working from today <coughs> now I look at that photograph I don't know whether you can see what I see when I look at that photograph but when I look at that photograph the first thing that occurs to me apart from the fact that um, the guy digging the hole there, whose name is Jamie, um, is smack in the middle of the picture, right behind her head, and sort of spoiling the composition, really, in a way. Um, apart from that, which we can easily solve, we just don't paint him, <coughs> the horizon and the waterline are going downhill. In a photograph, you probably wouldn't even notice it. But in a painting, it becomes very apparent. And when I paint a painting, it's generally around for years. And hopefully it'll survive for centuries. And one of the most awful things is to have a painting on your wall that every time you look at it, once you've realised that there's something amiss you're going oh there's a bit that's not quite right so the first thing I do is I look at these pictures and I think it would be better if the horizon was straight it always is and it would be better if the sea line was straight let's get rid of Jamie out of the picture and let's <coughs> of course Modern cameras have a habit of producing long, tall photographs when you use them in this way. They're working on a, a very long, thin uh, ratio now. And I'm going to be painting this painting 7 inches by 5 inches, so a 7 by 5 ratio. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put that picture into Photoshop. And I'm going to correct using Photoshop all the things that I feel are wrong with the painting. And I've already done that. So let's have a look at the corrected picture.
There we go. <coughs> As you can see now, the the line of the water uh, and the it's like a, a a pipe I think going out into the sea there that's just above her head is now horizontal, and so is the horizon. And Jamie's disappeared out of the photograph. And what we've got is a nice photograph <coughs> of Oriana, that's her name, looking straight out to sea. Now, you'll notice one of the things that I talked about before was that there are very few skin tones in this photograph, which is unusual. You think, I'm going to paint a figure, I'm going to need lots and lots of skin tones. <clears throat> but the only place on this photograph where you can see what you would classify as a, a normal sort of skin tone is at the end of her, her foot there where you can see her toes, uh, a little bit on her leg and the top of her arm. The rest of it, we're looking at very different shades. So we're going to have to deal with that in a very, very different way. So I'm actually going to be painting a figure But there's hardly going to be any flesh tones in there, which is going to be a challenge. So, let's show you how I do it. Let's go to the back to the overhead shot. The way I do it nowadays is I work off a tablet when I'm um, when I'm painting. In the studio you can see here there it is you can see the the photograph there on the tablet I've got a little stand here that puts it in front of me the great thing about working on a tablet <coughs> is of course that you can zoom in you can zoom in and you can get a good look at the detail that you can't do if you've just got a print there in front of you. So that sits there in front of me. The paper. Let's talk about the paper. Let's talk about the type of paper that I use. This is 100% cotton paper, 100% cotton rag. Uh, it works so much nicer, I find, than a wood base paper like Buckingford or, or whatever. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the big mistakes that um, beginning artists make is not knowing how much of a difference the paper that you're working on is going to make to the actual way, to the way that the paint flows on the paper. And <clears throat> one of the biggest struggles I had when I first started paint, painting was not understanding that. And I'd be putting the paint on and, and it wouldn't be doing what I wanted it to do. And I realised fairly quickly that the one thing you do not stint on, the one thing you do not cut corners on, is the paper. Work on the best paper that you can afford and you will find that it works so much better for you this is 100% cotton it's a De La Roni paper the Langton Prestige it's acid free <coughs> and this this is um, a grain known as knot paper Watercolour paper comes in different grades and we're talking the type of surface that you're working on. And basically there are three grades. <coughs> There's a very smooth grade which is great for things like botanical illustration and, and de very detailed sort of illustrative work. I'm never comfortable with that. I don't really enjoy it. But it's a very smooth grade. And that's called hot pressed. Because when they make this paper, they 
press it between sheets of cloth to squeeze the water out of the paper, out of the paper pulp, and to um, give it a texture. And <clears throat> hot pressed is exactly what it says. When they press the paper, it's hot. And the uh, cloth that they put on top of it is very, very smooth. So you get a very smooth paper. This is what they call cold pressed paper, which is known as not, as in not hot. That's basically what it is, as far as, as, far as I know. This is not hot. This is cold pressed paper. Uh, and it's known as knot, N-O-T. And you'll find that um, it gives an in-between grain. There's still a grain on the paper, and the grain on the paper, to me, is what gives watercolour its character and what allows it to flow in the way that you want it to. <clears throat> the, the other paper, which I will use quite often if I'm working on a larger uh, piece of paper, is known as rough which is literally rough because it, it's rough. Self-explanatory. Well, this paper that we're working on here is 100% cotton, not it cold-pressed paper. And it gives a certain lovely balance between absorption and holding the paint on top and allowing the paint to flow. Watercolour paper is covered in what they call size and the size allows you to actually write or paint on the paper. If it wasn't sized it would be blotting paper and blotting paper is, is if, you can, if you're old enough do you remember the days when we used uh, pen and ink all the time and we would have to use blotting paper to absorb the surplus uh, ink? So blotting paper is meant to do that. It's meant to absorb immediately. And if you don't size paper, that's what it becomes. So you'll find if you are experimenting that um, that you'll find what works for you, and that's what I, what I should say. Try different papers, try them on different in different ways on different subjects, and find what works for you. This works for me. I've already drawn the image out. It saves time. Uh, when you're doing a project like uh, this one that I'm doing here. Uh, if you if you drawing takes time and I think it's boring for people to watch uh, in many respects so I've roughly drawn out um, the the image here that I, uh, that I, I, I want to paint I tend to work in, in outlines on the watercolor paper um, <clears throat> and everything is there as a guide for me in the end, once you start painting, it's the painting that, that brings it all to life. But you will find that um, with watercolour, I find that a good drawing is the basis for everything. Get it right in the drawing. Make sure you've got the proportions right. Make sure that it, everything is where you want it, how you want it. Uh, Start off as you mean to go on, really. Give yourself a good start. All right, the next thing that uh, you're going to see me do is I am going to mask off the parts of this painting that are light. They don't have to be white because I will paint into them later on. But I want to preserve the white areas and the light areas right at the beginning 
so that I don't make an error and have a, a dark colour go into somewhere that has got to be light because you're working with the with the paper. You're working your lights your lightest light on that page is always going to be the the paper. So to preserve the whites is really really important. I've just noticed here there's a little bit of a light there that could be nice that I've missed out on as I've drawn it. Uh, and I've also I think got to bring this line down here that's it. You draw it in and you notice things afterwards. So just that's it. That's better. So I go over the painting after I've drawn it in and I look really hard into the painting to see what I might have missed. And to spend time just looking. So much of, so many of the problems that you could get. Let me zoom in a little bit so you can see what I'm doing here. So many of the problems that you can get stem from not looking properly. I I I, <clears throat> I say to people who are starting out that one of the main things that you have to do as an artist is you have to train yourself to see the world differently than everyone else. And um, so much of that is learning to look. So much of that is learning to, to see in a different way than other people see. And when you start, once you develop that, that's when you start to develop your artistic eye and you start to see the world differently than you did before. And that's when you start to be able to interpret the world in paint. So I take quite a long time before I um, get going and I look at the picture in front of me uh, and I see have I got everything that I need drawn out have I do I understand the picture and that's a big thing you you want to understand the, the, the image that you see in front of you before you even put any paint on picture now you what you're doing now is you're watching <laughs> you're watching my brain work I suppose I don't know how exciting that is for anyone it's probably very very boring I don't know but <clears throat> as I look at the at the image I can see these little highlights that I want to preserve and the way that I do that as I use this stuff. This is, hold it up to the camera. Uh, it's upside down. Artist's white mask, as it says on there, masking fluid. It's basically, it's latex. And I paint areas that I want to retain the colours that I want to retain. I what they call mask out with this masking fluid. I'm going to paint latex onto the surface of the paper. That's what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to draw it. I'm going to use this. This is a, a what the, this is known as a mapping pen. Um, I don't know where you can remember these from school and technical drawing at school. There is it. There it is. But you can see there that it's just two. It's a metal two two like fingers that come together and a, a circle here uh, and as you turn the the wheel the that's it the, the gap between opens up and cartographers used to use these for drawing maps because you can get very very fine lines by the way you adjust it and I found it's one of the best ways uh, of masking. You don't want to use your brushes. Don't use your brushes for masking. You'll ruin them. Masking fluid paints havoc with brushes. And, and, it, and it's unnecessary. You, as you put in masking fluid on, let me, let me see. Let's dip in there. You can see there it's inside the hole and as i look and go right this here where her toe is i want to preserve that so i paint on a blob of masking fluid there we go Now it does tend to dry very quickly and sometimes it, it will clog up the brush. So quite often when I do it, I have a piece of um, kitchen roll and I'll just give it a little wipe so that it, to stop it clogging up all the time. There's another glint here on the watch that I want to preserve. Uh, this little bit of towel or something that is just poking them out above their knees there which defines them beautifully and this is where the line comes into place well because there's a glint of light there now the other thing that I tend to put in as well is the highlights in the hair because while they're never going they're not going to be white in the end it helps to define the hair I find if you save the, um, the highlights straight away with some masking fluid and you'll find that when we got down to doing the hair later on that these saved highlights will come into their own they're not going to be white they're just going to be lighter parts of the hair but saving them now will mean that we don't have to mess about as much as we would do otherwise <coughs> now in in certain circumstances I might actually mask out something like the whole t-shirt there um, on the basis that I might want to do 
large washes across it. But in, in this particular circumstance, I'm not going to need to do that, I don't think. Um, except for this particular edge here, where the sand is going to be painted. So I'm just going to define and protect this edge on the t-shirt. That way when I'm painting the beach, <coughs> if I just go over a little too much, it won't it won't matter because the the masking fluid will protect it. Same here on this edge here where the beach is going to be painted. Don't need to protect it from the hair because we will do maybe doing the hair after. Um, there's a glint here on the edge of the t-shirt and there's a glint here on the edge of the t-shirt. There's a flesh tone that is going to come in here. Which I will save at the moment. One of the things that uh, you're told when you first start watercolour painting is that you always work <coughs> from light to dark uh, yeah. um, and so you always start by working all the lights first and then work towards the dark parts of the painting. That's all very well, but I found over the years that I get a lot further, a lot faster, if I mask out and protect areas that I want to protect. And then you'll probably find that I, when I get going here, will be putting dark colours in quite early on because I find that the dark colours map out the picture for me and as I get the dark colours on I can start to see the the overall painting a lot clearer I'm just going to do just going to protect Actually, I'm going to protect the whole edge down here of the T-shirt. You have to find a way that works for you. I started out when I started out um, with watercolour, doing that same old thing of making sure that um, I always work from light to dark and all this sort of thing. Uh, <coughs> but I found over time that this way of working is better for me. And it all contributes, it all goes towards creating <coughs> your own style, really. 
I think a lot of my particular style comes from this, I suppose, rather meticulous sort of <coughs> <coughs> I do apologise for this cough. It really is irritating. And I realise that I've got a microphone here and I'm probably maxing out every time I cough. Uh, I, I can only apologise. There we go. That's it. Protecting edges. Actually, let's protect that as well. There we go. I think that's fine. <coughs> Right, you will see me use masking fluid again a little later on when we start to work on the beach. It's masking fluid is quite amazing stuff. You can use it to do like I've done there, just to protect particular areas of your painting and preserve the the highlights, or you can use it <coughs> very um, as a technique. For creating textures there is a fantastic fantastic watercolor artist by the name of joe francis dowden i don't know whether you've seen his work if you haven't type joe francis dowden into a search engine and look at joe's work it's amazing he, he he's developed this technique of painting in watercolor It makes it look, at first glance, that you're looking at a photograph. It's incredible. But it, as you, the closer you get to it and the more you look at it, you realise it's not photographic at all. It's so painterly. And you can see all the paint. And he creates these amazing textures and amazing sort of visual effects by using techniques, masking fluid, splattering, all sorts of different techniques. We'll see some of the, as I'm, as I'm working on this painting today, but we'll see more and more of them as the, as the weeks go by. But uh, <clears throat> he's actually done some videos as well, uh, some DVDs, and uh, done one or two books as well. I would recommend anybody that's learning watercolour to study Joe Dowden's work because you, you will learn things that you'll learn from Joe Dowden that you won't learn from other people. Anyway. <clears throat> what we need to do now is to let the masking fluid dry. Um, it's very important not to try to start painting on any of the, near to any of those areas where you put the masking fluid until it's dried. Uh, you will just <coughs> smear the masking fluid but worst of all you will get masking fluid in the bristles of your lovely watercolour brushes. And believe me, that is the last thing that you want. It, masking fluid and watercolour brushes go together so badly. So badly. Right. While that masking fluid down the bottom half of the picture dries, let's have a look at the sky. The sky in this painting is very, 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 almost flat. This is a very 
beautiful summer's day. It's one of the most beautiful days that uh, I can remember for a long, long time. It, we went uh, a couple of weeks ago. We went to quite a relatively quiet beach in Wales, uh, in, on Anglesey, and it was idyllic. I can only I can only say that it was idyllic. The, the the sun was shining, the sea was so clear and beautiful, and to try and reproduce that is what we're going to try and do here. Now, one of the things with the sky is that you do not want to mess with it too much. You want to get it on and let it have its moment, let it spread. So I've got myself a fairly large brush, uh, it's, it's, it's a one inch, no it's a three quarters of an inch brush. And I'm going to get a good wet blue. This is French ultramarine. And I'm just going to go across from the top to the bottom. I don't know whether you can see it here, but I'm actually working on a board that's on a slant. If I hold the paper flat, you'll see that's it flat, but maybe that can give you an idea of the slant. The, the slight rake of the board is going to give you... Um, a way of the water and the colour flowing downwards, which is what you want. So let's get let's just get it on. Great. Do you know what I've got to do? I need, I need a better system than this. For um, <laughs> dear, 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 dear. Oh, that's it. Now that is not identical to the blue that you see on the screen. I have tried and tried and tried to see if I can reproduce that blue on the screen with watercolour and I have failed every time. The only way I can get the same sort of blue that you can see in the photograph, let me just show you the photograph again, is by adding white to it and I, I don't want to do that because it's a totally different sort of um, sort of thing uh, but you can see that the painting that the that the sky there starts off slightly darker and then as it works its way to the horizon it goes slightly lighter then you can see the horizon line there and then as it comes towards you again it's a little lighter again so that's what I'm trying to replicate. It looks very dark on that picture, but it isn't that dark. And it is going to lighten up as it goes. Now before the paper dries, which we don't want it to do, going to just put in the horizon line there. OK, 
Okay. What you've got to remember when you're working and what you've got to bear in mind all the time is that you are creating a painting. You are not a photographer. You are not trying to create a photograph. You are trying to create a painting. So you might do as I've just done there and actually add a slight texture to the sky um, that you can see here. Had a sort of white area that when I let it dry and uh, dry for a minute, uh, and add in the horizon line again, we'll do give it a little bit more perspective than is actually there on the actual photograph because the only people that are going to see this are going to be seeing a painting. They're not going to be seeing the photograph. And so it's important that what you create, you're working from the photograph, but you're actually creating um, a painted image. I'm going to just try and... Uh, this is where the, the technical thing comes in that I haven't quite mastered yet. I'm going to try and just correct the colour a little bit on this screen. Uh, get it a, bit, a little bit more like reality. Because at the moment that's showing up really a bit dark and it's not like that at all. I think I might have to get a different overhead camera uh, to. It's probably better. I'm having trouble getting a good sharp image on the close up. Um, and I'm also having trouble getting the colours to look anywhere near like reality. I've been struggling with this for days actually. I'll probably get a different camera on that overhead shot. That looks better. Yeah. Today is the day that I have set aside really for getting it, getting these uh, little technicalities ironed out. Uh, and trying to make sure, see if this all works. This is why I'm working on a painting that isn't some somebody else's life particularly. This is why I'm working on a painting that um, is is it's just a, this is just a test. This is just a test. Let's see what happens. Um, I mean, I realise there's not actually much to see there for you yet. <coughs> this has been. A, so far being a, a video of me talking most of the time. 
<coughs> it's important now to let this dry. some degree. I think watercolour is a game of patience. I switch the camera over, you are literally watching paint dry. Watercolour is a game of patience. This is why um, I, I, I've always wondered whether this format would actually work because it's a long game. It, it is. Watercolour is not a sprint. It can be. I mean, you can do very um, loose, very intuitive sort of watercolours. And I've, uh, I've done things like that myself in the past. Um, and I know a lot of people enjoyed that side of watercolour. This type of watercolour work that I do is quite sort of intensely um, detailed and <clears throat> and it needs time to breathe it needs to breathe it needs to um, if I rush now and I started adding more paint to anywhere anywhere in that sky it would go wrong and if I went I need that sky and the beach to get in to be, so that I can actually get the tones balanced so that has got to dry a little bit before I do anything else you can tell when it dries because even though and actually what I'm working on here I didn't show you before uh, when I started to talk about the paint uh, the paper what I'm working on here is it's called it's called a block and I like to work on a block it saves having to stretch the paper uh, when you're working on watercolor paper it needs to be it needs to be held down because it, it, as it gets wet it cockles and when this paper gets wet like it's done here it cockles but as it dries it's going to go flat again because it's actually glued down at the edges there are a dozen or so sheets of paper all glued to the edges here which is keeping it tight and what I do so as I get a nice line is I draw out my seven by five watercolor size image size and then I put masking tape, low tack masking tape, make sure it's low tack so it doesn't rip the surface off the paper as you take it off. Uh, and I mask the the edges of the paper. So as you can see here, I painted over the edges of the masking tape, but when I peel that off, there'll be a nice, clean, straight line. I do like to work on a block there's a there's that side let's get another paper now all the, the only color that i have actually put on to this paper yet has been french ultramarine and very 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 watered down there's hardly any pigment here and i'm just going to Draw in carefully the line of the horizon. Sort of looks a bit wobbly at the moment, but that's because the paper's cockled. As the paper dries, it it was it will it will be leave me. It will be straight. <coughs> I 
you can take bets if you like as you as you're watching this as to how many times this uh, little contraption here that I've got falls over <laughs> as uh, as the day goes on. Right. I think what we can do now, looking at this, is we can start to work on the beach. This line here is now dried. So we can start to actually work on the sand of the beach. I'll have a little look at the picture. You can see here that the, the beach is textured. It also... There's a, a light-ish line there, uh, just before we get to the water line. There's a light edge. And then the area of the sand here is darker. And then as we get closer, it gets more textured and it gets sort of grayer in a way. But there is always a light a uh, bit of sand glinting beneath the grey. This is this is this is the ripples in the sand that are made by the it's made by the action of the water over the surface of the sand. Um and we want to try and indicate that. I am not going to paint every individual ripple. There's no need for that sort of intensity. Um and one thing that I don't know whether you've can see it here but if you notice the highlights in the hair are very similar in color to the beach so I wouldn't worry too much if I go over the edge uh, of the hair as I'm putting in the beach color because there's a lot of similarity here between the, the colors here the highlights and here so we ought to be not too worried about that. Also, as it gets closer to you, the sand is getting lighter. This area of the, that's in sunlight here is quite intense in comparison to this here. Now, this almost goes against the laws of atmospheric perspective. The laws of atmospheric pers atmospheric perspective say that um, as things get further away they get lighter that leaves me with a decision to make do I go with what's there and what I can see or do I go with the rules in inverted commas of art and the rules that are people have gone by for making paintings for centuries uh, we're going to have to see what happens to be perfectly honest let's see so what I'm going to do now I'm, that sky is absolutely fine as far as I'm concerned what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do the beach um, and the, the first thing I'm going to do is to find a beachy tone. That can be quite tricky. I tend to go towards a a mixture of um, burnt umber and a tiny touch of uh, burnt sienna there just to warm it up slightly and a little bit of yellow ochre but it, it's a very wet mix for this first wash because you don't want it to go dark too quickly and out of the way. I want to show you something else.
this. This is one of the most valuable things that I have <laughs> in many respects. What you've got here, when I take these paintings off, uh, off the boards and, or off the block or whatever, quite often I then trim them down and trim off the edges. But I never throw the edges away. I save them and I put them in this pot. And as you can see here, I use them. Let me just turn it around. That's it, you can see here. I use them to test my colours on. Never ever throw anything away because you will find that these little swatches are worth their weight in gold. Let's put some down there. Because what I'm going to do before I actually... Sorry, I just put my head right by the microphone. I bet that sounded horrible. Um, before I actually put any paint actually onto the... Um, onto the paper, I'm just going to test that colour to see how it feels for me. Now that is, in my estimation, too warm. I need to cool it down a little bit. So how are we going to cool it down? We're going to get cool it down. Let's take a, a little bit of that French ultramarine, just a little bit, and add that to the colour there. And now let's try that. That's much better. Maybe a little touch just to add there of alizarin crimson as well. Let's try that. That's nice. That's nice. And so working down the paper, going over the hair, not because remember we've we've saved the highlights in the hair already so we can just work straight across the hair not worrying about it now if the as I do this there will be areas of it's not going to be totally flat I'm going to let the paper glint through in areas Because that way Putting, pa putting paint on is one thing, but remember that you can always take that paint off again. And in the act of taking it off, you will imbue it with a certain amount of texture. That's why I like to use kitchen roll. It's textured. And there's another reason that I use the paints that I use as well, is that I tend to use paints that aren't 
staining too much. Different watercolour, I'm doing it again, different watercolour paints work in different ways. And you'll find that what people don't realise is that if the paints that you use are not staining paints too much, you can actually take the paint off <coughs> and use that as a te technique as much as putting the paint on. I spend a lot of the time, you'll see me dab the surface of the paint, the painting with um, with the paper. And as, what I'm doing as I do that isn't just um, clean, trying to erase mistakes, it, it's actually adding surface te texture to the painting. mistakes that people that are starting out make and, and I was guilty of it myself for a long time when you're starting to work with watercolour is that you forget for some reason that The clue to watercolour painting is in the name. What you're actually painting with, most of the time, is coloured water. The, the biggest mistake that I see people make when they're starting out is that they try to treat it like oil paint and it doesn't work that way. And you, they try to treat it in, in a way that... Um, Basically, you're adding far too much pigment. The paint in this box lasts me for an age because the pigment is strong. I always use artist quality watercolours that have the most pigment in them. And you only need a tiny touch and that water that you're working with becomes... powerful colour and maybe you want that maybe you don't what I'm doing now is I'm doing a technique known as as dry brushing And I'm dragging the, instead of actually trying to paint it an even surface, I'm dragging a fairly dry brush with, brush with just a little pigment in it over the surface of the paper. And because the paper, the paper is textured, It doesn't always sit. It, it basically is because the paper is textured. The, the paint is hitting the tops of the of the of the texture. Um 
and the, the areas in the below the surface are are staying as highlights. I don't know whether you, how well you can see that. Let's try zooming in again. There we are. You can see it. I'm so, I'm so sorry for the poor quality of this camera. I've got to do something about it. For maybe to, maybe for tomorrow if I get time. Replace it. And what I'm doing here is I'm. Creating texture to the beach and leaving little highlights. Now it's going to be smoother as we get further away because we don't see those highlights the same. We see less of them as we get further away. And then as you get closer, you'll see more highlights and there'll be bigger highlights. Now it doesn't matter, as I said, about, about it's going over the, the hair there because we've already protected the highlights in the hair with the masking tape and the actual hair itself is going to be considerably darker than the sand. The sand might at the moment look quite dark uh, compared to everything else. But once we put everything else in, you'll realize that the sand is actually a lot lighter than it looks. I'm not trying to paint the actual details of the ripples in the sand. What I'm doing is I'm just creating a texture that it that simulates that. And once the rest of the painting is there around it, that is going to look like a beach. Now, as I'm doing this, the, the beach itself is, the paint is drying. And it's allowing me to work over the top all the time to get these textures done. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just, in a different shape, brush. Where's my round brush? And I'm going to start looking at the areas where people have been digging in the sand which creates these holes and these textured areas. Oh, 
it goes again. <laughs> it's almost getting embarrassing. I've got to do something about this. Okay. This is all a learning process for me, this. It really is. Not the painting. I've been doing the painting for years, but the tech side of it, uh, getting the tech side out, I was actually, um, I was probably when I'm a little bit croaky, I was actually up until four o'clock this morning trying to get the tech right, trying to make everything work properly. find that as I am working and you'll probably find as you're watching me that when I get into these bits that are a little bit more when I'm adding the little details I will tend to go quieter there are bits on the sand there always are that are where people have been digging or where the stones are or whatever that create darker areas, darker textures, there's little spotty darks as I would call them and and they create interest. Again, dry brushing the uh, surface of the paper, producing a texture, a sort of grainy texture as we get closer, helps to give a, a sense of sandiness, I suppose, uh, for want of a better term. We are trying to create a feeling of sandiness. And each brush will give you a different sort of texture as you dry brushing like this and uh, you've got to know when to stop I think that's one of the big things is knowing when to stop but what you're doing is you're looking for a way of Giving the feel of sandiness. Oh, that's looking okay, to be honest. 
Now I one or two little tiny dots of mops and things in the distance there. Right, now then, I'm going to just put in the, the pipe that's going across the, the water line there. First of all, there's a little rocky outcrop sticking out there. And then let's make sure that we've got enough. It's very dark, but it's quite warm. So what I'm going for here is a mixture of paint grey and burnt umber. brush it across there I so I'm gonna lighten it up a little bit from actually what it's like in the photograph because to me that looks a little long natural and I can actually just just drop a little bit texture into it is it heads Don't want to ever just make things like a, a total straight line necessarily. In general, nature doesn't like straight lines very much. So, oh, there's a little bit of, I don't know, there's a bit of sandiness here that I've missed. You don't have to be a, a slave to the uh, the painting, to the photograph. You you're making a painting. One of the strange things is that one of the most common things that people say when they see my work is that they say, "Oh my goodness, it's just like a photograph." It's, just a, it's like a photograph but actually it's not if you get close to it if you walk up to it it's not it's a painting and it looks like a painting I think they're just I don't know it's hard to define what people actually say Um, do it 
this thing and I think what I'll do now is I'll kind of work on uh, the blanket that she's sitting on and um, you know it's trying to get the big areas covered quite correctly now the blanket that she's sitting on it is going to be very done with the same colour as the sky only much more intense so let's just before we go any further just get the to define it straight across there because we will be putting the dark in there again we want texture we don't want it to be a great big smooth mass because what's interesting there I mean there's nothing very interesting in something so smooth that now let's come in and define the shadows in there of which there are many At the moment, I'm still only using ultramarine. There is no other color going on here. Defining the areas quite loosely using the drawing that I've got underneath as a guide, but keeping quite loose. do my thing that everybody goes whoa what are you doing I'm going to define a really dark area okay this is where it goes against all the rules of watercolor painting that say always go from dark to light from light to dark uh, yep, yeah, okay.
I've got there is I've put on a lot of Payne's Grey into that, darkened it down, but now with some almost pure ultramarine I'm putting on some texture into it and as it touches the paint grey it will soften the lines that I put in Remember, we want to create surfaces that are interesting to the eye. thing to be aware of as you're doing this and it's to do with that whole thing of photographs and reproductions and everything that I was talking about earlier is that the colours that you see on a screen like I'm looking at at the moment you're looking at light You're looking at a glowing surface. And whereas actually what I'm doing is I'm putting pigment onto paper. And I, you've got to be aware all the time that you're making a painting. You're not duplicating a photograph. Let's add some paint grey and burnt umber. There will be moments, I'm sure, when what I'm doing here is very, very boring. 
uh, to watch. That's okay. As you can see, this is not going to be done in just a few minutes. Let's pop that back a little bit. Right. I think that is enough for this session. It's time to take a break. I've been sitting here for two hours um, and it's not good to sit for too long. So I'm going to leave it at that for uh, a moment and I'll probably be back in about an hour. I shall be back, let's say it's 12 o'clock now. I'll be back at one o'clock to carry on. Thanks very much if you uh, watched any of this. And uh, I'll uh, 